Welcome, welcome, welcome one and all to this very special celebration of Christmas from the New York Irish Centre and compliments of the season to you all. I am genuinely delighted to be able to join you because, well, I have a lot of history with New York City. I have a lot of friends here and a lot of connections and so many great memories. Memories like, well, the unbelievable euphoria of, uh, of nights at Carnegie Hall or the world-class hangovers the night the morning after, after parading my way through most of the Irish bars on 2nd Avenue. Uh, but I have, as I say, some great memories of New York. One of my, one of my most precious memories was uh, uh, in 2012 when my family came over from Ireland to join me when I was doing a run of my one-man show in the Irish Repertory Theatre here in, uh, in Chelsea. Um, that was a memory that, is, that has been treasured in our family for a long, long time. Five of our six kids are now scattered around the world. So I know, I know what the pain of missing your loved ones at Christmas feels like. Believe me, I do. This damn COVID has separated so many from friends and family back home in Ireland. So tonight is an attempt to bring a little bit of Ireland to you, the Irish away from home. I hope our mix of songs, and stories and spoken word will help you feel connected. You know, you may be far from Ireland, but trust me, you're never far from our thoughts. Enjoy the evening and happy Christmas. William Butler Yeats is widely considered one of the greatest poets of the English language. He received the 1923 Nobel Prize for Literature. His work was greatly influenced by the heritage and politics of Ireland. The Magi is a short poem inspired by the three wise men of the Christmas Nativity, with many meanings about people who, upon reaching old age, or perhaps just older age, turn to God and the spiritual world for fulfillment and happiness. Yeats wrote the short poem in 1914 while he was living in London. In this eight-line poem, Yeats follows the journey of the Magi. His Magi are the unsatisfied ones on their unrequited search for meaning in the uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor. With this poem, he is saying that people who have given up hope that they will ever be happy in their hectic, strife-filled material worlds are now turning to God in order to find some sense of peace and fulfillment in their lives. The Magi by William Butler Yeats. Now, as at all times, I can see in the mind's eye, in their stiff, painted clothes, the pale, unsatisfied ones appear and disappear in the blue depths of the sky with all their ancient faces like rain-beaten stones and all their helms of silver hovering side by side and all their eyes still fixed hoping to find once more being by calvary's turbulence unsatisfied the uncontrollable mystery on the bestial floor. Okay, we go first? Yeah. Okay. A sober black shawl Hides her body entirely Touched by the sun And the salt spray of the sea But down in the darkness A slim hand 
so lovely Carries a rich bunch of red roses for me Her petticoat simple And her feet are but bare And all that she has Is both neat and scanty But stars in the deeps Of her eyes are exclaiming I carry a rich bunch Of red roses for thee Sits enthroned on her forehead Or swings from a white ear For all men to see But jeweled desire In a bosom so pearly Carries a rich bunch of red roses for me. Seamus Heaney, the poet, playwright, and translator, was born in County Derry on April the 13th, incidentally the same day, April the 13th, that Samuel Beckett was born, in 1939. During his lifetime, Heaney, of course, was and is still recognised as one of the principal contributors to poetry in Ireland, indeed across the world. He received the 1995 Nobel Prize in Literature, and upon his death in 2013, the newspapers described him as probably the best known poet in the world. And that fame continues. US President-elect Joe Biden has often quoted Heaney's poetry and his reading of the Cure of Troy went viral after his election victory. I'm going to read a little poem called Holly by Seamus Heaney. It rained when it should have snowed. When we went to gather holly, the ditches were swimming. We were wet to the knees. Our hands were all jags and water ran up our sleeves. There should have been berries, but the sprigs we brought into the house gleamed like smashed bottle glass. Now here I am, in a room that is decked with the red buried waxy leaf stuff. And I almost forgot what it's like to be wet to the skin or longing for snow. I reached for a book like a daughter and wanted to flare around in my hand, a black letter bush, a glittering shield wall, cutting as holly and ice. Swan. Hi, it's Judy Collins, and I'm just 
calling and reaching out to you to remind you to think about the people that you love so much and that you can't see during this time of the pandemic. You can dream, maybe you can get on Zoom to talk to people, that's one way to connect. I'm gonna probably do that with all of my family. And I try to connect with my friends on Zoom, so try it, you'll like it. And I just want to wish you a happy holiday, the happiest New Year, Christmas, Hanukkah, all the things you celebrate. And I thought I'd sing you a little bit of a new song of mine about Ireland. There's a new moon over the Hudson, and the stars are shining bright. And I think about my true love in Ireland tonight, just as you do, I'm sure, of so many of your loved ones around the world. Have a happy holiday, and remember, there's always love. George Bernard Shaw was born on July the 26th, 1856. He was an Irish playwright, critic, polemicist, and political activist. His influence on Western theater, culture, and politics extended from the 1880s to his death and beyond. He wrote more than 60 plays, including major works such as Man and Superman in 1902, Pygmalion, 1912, and St. Joan in 1923. Shaw became the leading dramatist of his generation and in 1925 was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. He also won an Oscar for the screenplay of Pygmalion. In Britain, he is regarded as second only to Shakespeare. He died on the 2nd of November 1950. So what does Shaw say about Christmas? Christmas is, for me, simply a nuisance. The mob supports it as a carnival of mendacity, gluttony, and drunkenness. Fifty years ago, I invented a society for the abolition of Christmas. So far, I am the only member. That is all I have to say on the subject. Well, he may have given Christmas short shrift, but his love for Ireland never failed. Eternal is the fact that the human creature born in Ireland and brought up in its air is Irish. I have lived for 20 years in Ireland and for 72 in England, but the 20 came first, and in Britain I am still a foreigner and shall die one. Since his childhood in Dublin, George Bernard Shaw spent many hours in the National Gallery of Ireland, calling it a place to which he owed much of the only real education I ever got as a boy in air. Just before his 94th birthday, he completed his last will, leaving one third of his posthumous royalties to the gallery. In 1922, civil war broke out in the South between its pro-treaty and anti-treaty factions, the former of whom had established the Irish fleet free state. Shaw visited Dublin in August and met Michael Collins, then head of the free state's provisional government. Shaw was much impressed by Collins and was saddened when three days later, the Irish leader was ambushed and killed by anti-treaty forces. In a letter to Collins' sister, Shaw wrote, I met Michael for the first and last time on Saturday last, and I'm very glad I did. I rejoice in his memory and will not be so disloyal to it as to snivel over his valiant death. Shaw remained a British subject all his life, but took dual British-Irish nationality in 1934. One starry night as I lay sleeping one starry night as I lay in bed, I dreamed I heard wagon wheels a creaking. But when I awoke, my own love was playing. I was searching. 
Clive Staples Lewis, known as C.S. Lewis, was born in Belfast on November 29th, 1898. He was a writer and theologian, and for over 40 years he held academic positions in English literature at both Oxford and Cambridge. He wrote more than 30 books which sold millions of copies and is best known for his works of fiction, especially the books that make up the Chronicles of Narnia that have been popularized on stage, TV, radio, and film. He died on November 22nd, 1963. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Chapter 10. Didn't I tell you, answered Mr. Beaver, that she'd made it always winter and never Christmas. Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top and did see. It was a sledge and it was reindeer with bells on their harness, but they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer. They were not white, but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside it and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because, though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it's rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly, 
But now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, said he. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you only get if you're being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence. There is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it in your house as I pass. If you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy. It's locked up. Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find your dam finished and mended and all the leaks stopped and a new sluice gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer. And they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver and across it there ramped a red lion as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must only use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss. And when you put this horn to your lips and blow it then, wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy, Eve's daughter, and Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass, but people said afterwards that it was made of diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there was cordial made of juice of one of the, f of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends is hurt, a few drops of this restore them. And the dagger is to defend yours at great need, for you also are not to be in battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I, I think, I don't know, but I, I think I could be brave enough. That is not the point, he said, but battles are ugly when women fight. And now, here he suddenly looked less grave. Here is something for the moment for you all. And he brought out, I suppose, from the big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it. A large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream and a great big teapot, all sizzling and piping hot. And then he cried out, Merry Christmas long, live the true king, and cracked his whip. And he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized that they had started. Hi there. Do you know it's a funny thing, but of all of the songs that I've written down through the years, as I've got a little older and the hair's turned a little more grey, as you can see, there are only a handful of songs that have stayed really important in my own heart and soul. And they tend to be personal kind of songs, songs that have a little bit of myself in them. Now, on this very special day, here's a song 
that I wrote about my dad. So wherever you are, whoever you're with, I hope you have a good day. This is The Old Man. The tears have all been shed now We've said our last goodbyes His soul's been blessed He's laid to rest And as now I feel alone He was more than just my father My teacher, my best friend And he'll still be heard in the tunes we shared when I play them on my own And I never will forget him For he made me what I am And though he may be gone Memories linger on And I miss him, the old man As a boy, he'd take me walking by mountain, field and stream And he'd show me things not known to kings But secret between him and me Like the colours on a pheasant As he rises in the dawn Or how to fish or make a wish beside a fairy tree And I never will forget him For he made me what I am And though he may be gone Memories linger on And I miss him Forever, he seemed so big and strong. But the minutes fly and the years roll by for a father and a son. And suddenly, when it happened, there was so much left unsaid. No second chance to tell him thanks for everything he'd done. And I never will forget him For he made me what I am And though he may be gone Memories linger on God, I miss him The old man Season's greetings to everybody who is away from home or away from the people they love this Christmas. I'm Christine Keneally, founder of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University. I'm also a historian of Ireland's Great Hunger and of abolition, with a particular focus on Frederick Douglass. Who was Frederick Douglass? Born into enslavement in Maryland in 1818, the self-educated Frederick knew that he could not live his life in slavery. Aged only 20, he escaped to the North where he worked on the docks in New Bedford. In 1841, he attended an abolition meeting where he spoke in front of mainly white abolitionists. He quickly became the star of the movement, especially following the publication of his life story 
the narrative in May 1845. But this newfound notoriety put him in danger of recapture and being returned to enslavement. And he was persuaded to leave America for his own safety. So Frederick escaped again. He arrived in Dublin in August 1845. He had planned to stay in Ireland for four days, but the warmth of his welcome was such that he stayed for four months, a period he described as the happiest time of his life. In Christmas 1845, Frederick was in Belfast, lecturing on abolition. He was alone, staying in a hotel room and 3,000 miles away from his wife and four young children. He would have found solace in the fact that, for the first time in his life, he was truly free, safe, and was being treated as an equal of white men. He may also have reflected on what Christmas meant to be enslaved. He described in Christmas on the plantations thus, the days between Christmas day and New Year's are allowed the slaves as holidays. These days all regular work was suspended and there was nothing to do but keep fires and look after the stock. This time we regarded as our own by the grace of our masters. The holidays were variously spent, but the majority spent the holidays in sports, ball playing, wrestling, boxing, running foot races, dancing and drinking whiskey. And this latter mode of spending the time was generally most agreeable to their masters. Not to be drunk during the holidays was disgraceful and he was esteemed a lazy and improvident man who could not afford to drink whiskey during Christmas. In 2018, the 200th anniversary of Frederick's birth, I had the opportunity to lead a Frederick Douglass walking tour around Dublin as part of European Culture Night. I was joined by four of my dear Irish friends, Caroline Callery of the Irish Heritage Trust, Irish human rights activist and author, Don Mullen, singer and songwriter Declan O'Rourke, and Irish actor of stage, film and television, Kwaku Fortune, who played the role of Frederick Douglass that evening. So now let me introduce you to Kwaku Fortune. Kwaku was from Roundwood in County Wicklow and is of Ghanaian descent on his mother's side. Like myself, he is a graduate of Trinity College in Dublin. He gaining a bachelor's degree in acting in 2017. We also support the same soccer team, but I won't say who. Kwaku was the perfect fit to play Frederick Douglass, not least because he was then aged 27, the same age that Frederick was when he was in Ireland. While in Dublin, Frederick met his hero, the great Daniel O'Connell, a friend of the oppressed everywhere, but especially of enslaved people on the other side of the Atlantic. Frederick attended a meeting for the repeal of the Act of Union and Daniel invited Frederick to join him on stage. And the building you see behind me, Conciliation Hall, is the very building where this meeting took place. We will now hear part of the speech that Frederick made on that momentous evening. We will then hear Kwaku reflect on what it means to be black, to be Irish and to be Frederick Douglass. And gentlemen, the poor trampled slave of Carolina has heard the name of the liberator with joy and hope. And I myself have heard the wish that some black O'Connell would yet rise up amongst my countrymen and cry, agitate, agitate, agitate. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kwaku Fortune, and it's a pleasure to be here on the 175th anniversary of uh, Frederick Douglass' visit to Dublin. Uh, in terms of how I was introduced to him, I was actually quite late in my life. I, it's mad how, like, I don't know, not internal racism, but just a lack of knowledge. I didn't know that there was black people <laughs> in, in Ireland around the famine time. And it was only when I was studying in the Lear, we had to do speeches uh, in Trinity College for, for our second year programme. and. Um, one of the students came to this speech from Frederick Douglass and I'd heard about Frederick Douglass obviously but I didn't know his connection with Ireland I was kind of shocked that he came here at that time and did it was so well received and did all these speeches so uh, it was kind of incredible to 
to realize that and to to figure out more about his story and everything that went down and yeah so then it, the speeches I did was uh, his time when he met with uh, Daniel O'Connell uh, firstly and then uh, when he was leaving his tour because he basically did tour he, he spoke in Dublin and Limerick and Cork uh, so yeah it was just it was incredible and lovely to work with Christine she has such a, a vast infinite knowledge of this subject and not only about Frederick Douglass she was just talking about loads of black or mixed race people who had been in Ireland around that time and it was kind of like eye-opening especially as an actor because you're like wow these people like they're playable or there's a whole plethora of stories that we haven't seen so it was, it was really incredible. I think Frederick Douglass is a, a perfect role model for, for people from new communities as such um, as I've said me learning about him so late it, it's an interesting thing in terms of history, especially if you're other or, or from mixed race backgrounds or black, you, you're looking for role models and, and people who you can relate to on screen or like in, in TV, entertainment, in books, you're always looking for that. And for me, I always felt that in terms of history, there was never really someone I could look at. I mean, I was obsessed with Irish history and really proud of it but I could never see myself in that so to fig find out that like Frederick Douglass came here in the 18th century or around the time of the famine and was like well received and was nearly a hero and did was giving speeches it was it was actually quite incredible because coming from a minority or maybe minority is the wrong word but coming from like a mixed background you're nearly inwardly racist to yourself you don't see yourself in these stories I, I would always like look at these period pieces even on tv and i'd always like oh i'd love to play one of those guys but i don't think there was any black people back then that's the kind of things that i would say so i think to to figure out his story and to figure out that he did exist and, and the, ma the amazing journey that he took to get to where he got to i think it's very important for for this generation of people from mixed backgrounds and from black backgrounds to really know about here in this country. How are you doing? Declan O'Rourke here. I would like to sing a little song in solidarity with those of you who are struggling to get home this year. Um, I'll try and keep the message short, but um, I hope you find some way to enjoy it. Uh, the lovely Christine Kennelly suggested that I play a song to follow her amazing piece on Frederick Douglass and um, I asked which one she she might think was suitable and she suggested this song the Great St. Lawrence River um, and um, I think uh, part of me just wondered if something like this was appropriate and but when I you know I haven't played it for a while and when I examined the words it really made sense why it's why it's relevant um, and who knows you you take from it something yourself but sometimes I think uh, just knowing that there are always pe people worse off than than ourselves gives us uh, perspective and a bit of strength to to continue on wishing you peace and uh, and solace and good times ahead I think this whole all episode the gift of it the the gift of it may be that we appreciate normality a little more in future. All the best. In the crowded port of Dublin town The bedraggled hordes are gathering Seeking passage to a new world home 
Giving all they've ever loved and known To escape or die from tyranny The first stop they'll make is Liverpool In the cellars there below the street Down among the vermin and disease Some hide out until their ships can leave Lest they be deported back again Now the crossing is so treacherous With so many crammed into the hole The conditions are most suitable To the passing of the sickness of upon an icy swell Those with strength to see the river still Are now witnessing the dead of night To a strange macabre Spectacle Loaded bodies drifting out to Anchored up a gross hill, Canada. Forty vessels lined the St. Lawrence at the station there for quarantine. The sheer magnitude of suffering. Is beyond the helpless volunteers. In their thousands, they will perish there. Despite our efforts to contain the spread. Of the rampant typhus fever, it's like wildfire up the river. All the Rondo is on high
And St. John is filled with swarms of them Half starved wretches begging in the streets Mothers and their children in the snow No shoes or stockings on the free. They are more like ghosts than living things. They are more like ghosts than living things. Hi, my name is Colin McCann, and um, it's a pleasure to be with you this uh, Christmas and also to read a story that I wrote a few years ago called A Dublin Christmas. Every Christmas morning now is full of every Christmas morning then, and in the old, unaccountable unfolding of memory, I can't rest on a single time when it all took shape. But this is a story of a suburban Christmas, a Dublin Christmas, a Christmas in the four bedroom house where I spent my first 20 years and where 35 years on, I still return no matter where I happen to be. And this story doesn't have any snow covered belfries or high legged horses in the stone walled fields or snowstorms walling us in or single bar electric heaters or terrible high rise lifts that do not work or suicides or crazy ants dropping lit cigarettes into the deep folds of the sofa. No, rather, this is a story of an ordinary Christmas in an ordinary house at an ordinary time in the extraordinary glamour of childhood. The Irish novelist Ben Kiley has said that every corner is a world. And my world back then in the early 1970s was a house on the corner of Clonkeen Road in South Park near Dean's Grange, where I used to think that nothing bad happened or if it happened at all, it never much happened to me. I had, I suppose, a novelist's worst childhood. It was happy. Up from the cold dark of winter days, Christmas Eve unfolded into Christmas Day like a dolphin leap of delight. The holly was clipped from the bush in the front garden. The mistletoe was sellotaped over the front door. Eight years old, I sidled away, thinking I'd have to kiss my sisters now. The postman arrived with more cards to hang up. They were strung on lengths of crepe paper around the house. The turkey, at least, gave me a boy's adventure. Dead as the bird was, he still needed his neck chopped, and he was taken into the back garden, flopped out on a piece of wood, we peeped down from the gap in the upstairs curtains while the turkey was taken care of by my father. I whispered to my younger brother that it was his neck on the, on the block. Or was that my older brother who whispered it to me? And then the turkey was brought, brought indoors and plopped in the sink and the jokes were made about stuffing it. Christmas Eve, the darkness fell with a thump. Shoes to be polished, homemade puddings to be taken down from the top shelf, mince pies arranged in the biscuit boxes, the carefully iced cake was taken out from the room under the stairs. I had to have a bath of all things, the second in a week, no grumbling allowed. And then I padded downstairs in my soft warm pajamas to write the note for Santa. Dear Santi, I want a Stoke City jersey and peace in the world. 
we put three mince pies on a plate, some fruit cake, and poured a good measure of whiskey. The bottle label, which I loved, three swallows in flight. And then it was up the stairs thinking, I know why Santa's fat, but how come he never gets drunk? It was questions like that which occupied my mind and sent me to bed quite sure I'd never, ever, ever fall asleep, never. Because of the tinkling of bells outside, never. Because of the creaking of floorboards downstairs, never. Because of never, ever. Christmas Day rose with a thin reef of stars over the suburbs of Dublin. I pulled back the sheets and tiptoed onto the cold of the bedroom floor. Outside, the grass was wet with dew and there was not a hint of snow on the ground. But who cared? Mom, Dad, it's Christmas. Down the stairs, my younger brother Ronan and I leaped 18 steps at a time, quite an achievement since there were only 14. Onto the cold kitchen linoleum, he and I stepped, no shoes, no socks, no slippers. Around us, the whole house had begun to crackle awake. My older brother Sean turned the banisters. My older sisters Siobhan and Una would soon erupt in a tearaway scramble for the bathroom. But right then they were playing hide and go seek with sleep. Up the stairs, Ronan and I went to terrorize them. Hurry up, hurry up, it's Christmas. Mum and dad began to stir in that lovely silence that surrounded them every Christmas morning. And they came downstairs in dressing gowns to guide Ronan and I towards the fireplace. There was only one chimney, but it backed into two rooms. Terrible theatrics at first, since Santa Claus had a penchant of moving from one fireplace to the next. Oh no, oh no, Santa didn't come. And then we turned the corner where he had God bless him, eaten not only the mince pies and the fruit cake, but he'd taken care of a large glass of Powers whiskey too. Not only that, but he left a thank you note and I leaped about in my Stoke City jersey, screaming that I'd been a good lad after all. Imagine that, I had. Christmas morning, the white radiators clicked and the house began to heat. We jumped around like prayers in an air raid, which reminded us, sadly, that we had to go to Mass before opening the other presents. Baby Jesus was put in the crib. The three, rise, why, the three wise men were repositioned. And then it was on with the best clothes, neatly ironed, and we piled outside into the still dark morning, cold enough to stun the bones in our cheeks. We jumped all seven of us into the gold Vauxhall Victor, no seat belts, no car seats, and yet Yes, yes, those dolphin dreams of the rest of the day. It was an early mass in Cabantili, eight o'clock. Father George was famous for his lightning speed and his grumpiness, and all homily long, we dreamed of the presence under the tree. The priest droned on in a language we never understood. And afterwards, the light was of the quality that no dark could ever match. We skipped through Cabantili village towards the car, slid in and bantered all the way home. Christmas breakfast was a time to watch the clock turn. Sizzling bacon, eggs, steaming tea, toast slathered in too much butter. And strangely, this time around, there was no kicking under the table, no belching across the breakfast plates, no licking of the opposing sibling's teaspoon. There was harmony in our household, since we were all held aloft by the prospects of the presents, stacked this way and that under the shedding tree. Let's go! And we gathered around, opening the presents one by one. The fashionable orange sweatshirt, or so I thought. The shoot annual, and Roy of the Rovers book, and new Sabudio team. And a bike for Ronan, and a new perfume for Siobhan and a soft clip on the ear for telling her that maybe now she'd smell good. And dolphin discs token for Sean, and a scream of delight when Una opened up a package to reveal a Bay City roller scarf, of all things. Uh, there are no days more full than those we go back to. All those Christmases collide into each other and my memory is decorated by a series of mirrors flashing light into chambers of sound and color. The blue of the sky, even when it wasn't blue, it was blue. The briquettes sparking red layered on the fire, 
the crinkling of those ridiculous yellow paper hats at dinner time and my mother singing at the stove, oh, the boys are all mad about Nelly. And the dining room perfectly laid out in the silverware we'd see only once a year and the bad jokes and the crackers and the other jokes as dinner unfolded the light outside gradually dimming a bromide of sorts and the laughter moving to deep silence at three in the afternoon when we leaned up against one another like old tires full of turkey and gravy and trifle and god knows how many slices of plum pudding still there was enough room left to break the seal on the tin equality street and then we clicked the batteries into the horse racing game and the day stretched out in time so many hours that it seemed endless infinite elastic like the after image of a light that only by closing my eyes i can see i glimpse my childhood as it was and good it was and spoiled it was and safe it was and generous it was when we did not lack the peace of simple things when happiness came to us unasked when there was no end to what we could imagine when even santa claus brought us the possibility of peace still these moments rise and flash those christmas days without apology without heartbreak or revelation or dilemma and maybe to describe such happiness is to diminish it but is it enough to say that by the end of the evening, we slept and we dreamed? My father once told me that the best gift he ever got as a child back in the 1930s was a white donkey. But they lived in a small cottage in Fox Rock and had nowhere to keep the animal. Three days after Christmas, the donkey was sold again. A three day gift. But he didn't mind my father, not even when the money went into my grandfather's pocket. What momentary beauty and sadness. Every world a corner. And yet I have never thought that that gift or the story or even the donkey itself ends there. Rather, my mother and fa father brought that same gift to all the Christmases they gave to us. I used to wonder how I could thank my folks for those days in the uncomplicated suburbs of Dublin. But in recent years, I've learned that there is no way to thank them, really, other than to try to make these moments for my own children, in what I hope are, for them at least, the uncomplicated towers of New York, so that they get passed on in the deep grammar of memory. And there are times, I am sure, that I can hear on a cold snowy day, the hooves of a white donkey clopping along at the far end of Central Park. And why not? Because every Christmas morning now is full of every Christmas morning then. Happy holidays to everyone and thank you. Good luck for 2021.
Ivan Boland was an Irish poet, author, who was born on September the 24th, 1944. She was a professor at Stanford University, where she taught from 1996. Her work deals with Irish national identity and the role of women in Irish history. Boland died in Dublin this year on the 27th of April, 2020, aged 75. This reading is from Poetry Magazine, published in 2008. It's titled, Islands Apart, A Notebook. This year, back in Dublin for Christmas, I went into Grafton Street. It's the old central meeting place of the city, the backdrop of many lives. Met her today point blank in Grafton Street. The crowd brought us together. We both stopped, writes Joyce, at the end of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Now it's a pedestrian area, a bustle of mime artists and shoppers. It was perfect winter weather. In Ireland, the pre-Christmas weeks can be a small season of light before the January onslaught. The old city is a ghost haunting the new, more prosperous one. The same buildings are there, the same cobbled alleys, but the ethos has changed. This is a place that talks success, money and travel. Its youth is more cosmopolitan, more contemporary. Not far from the city centre and just three miles from our house is Merrion Square. There in Oscar Wilde's old neighbourhood are the Georgian houses of the old ascendancy. When I was young, many had become shabby and were subdivided into flats. In one basement, opposite the gates and gardens of the square, was the Lantern Theatre, a venue for plays and arts events. There I began covering poetry readings for the Irish Times. I covered them for years. I did it faithfully and without too much introspection. I was in my early 20s, the right age for it. The reading might be slated for 7 p.m. I would turn up on time at the theatre, the pub, the arts centre, the secondary school, the gallery. The poets might be there. They might equally not be there. The reading would begin on time, an hour late, two hours late. I would listen for the poems. I would shape my piece as I listened, quoting, referring, scribbling. Then sometime around midnight, I'd climb the stairs of the old Irish Times building in Westmoreland Street. And if nothing on the night editor's face suggested that he'd been waiting for this arrival, Nevertheless, I was given a chair and a typewriter. I would type out my article, hand it in, and drive home in a city laundered by quiet and moonlight. Occasionally at those readings, I would be enchanted and stirred by what I'd seen. Occasionally, I would think I had the answer, or part of it, to that perennial question about the poet's identity. One night in the Peacock Theatre, I saw Hugh MacDiarmid, the Scottish poet. He was elderly, dressed in a cord jacket, utterly in the moment. When he read about the white rose of Scotland, when he set out the lines, so I have gathered unto myself all the loose ends of Scotland. Something seemed to shimmer and open up behind his frail figure. A place itself burned into metaphor. What stirred me most was not the poetry. I certainly relished his work. All the same, I heard an earnestness in the Marxism and nationalism that now and again shouted down the lyric tact. What moved me was something else. When one burns one's bridges, what a very nice fire it makes, wrote Dylan Thomas. It's a winning statement, suggesting the kind of disregard for convention and orthodoxy poets were once associated with. 
but his statement has to be weighed against Patrick Kavanagh's words, published at the start of the 1964 edition of his collected poems. In his author's note, Kavanagh comments that the only true tragedy for the poet is poverty. On many occasions, I literally starved in Dublin, he writes. I often borrowed a shilling for the gas when in fact I wanted a coin to buy a chop. That chill reminder of economic vulnerability puts skills in a different light. It doesn't seem right to forget that often they're a lifeline for a poet, a way of buying time and living with dignity. Hello. Would no one put a blanket over your little body? We'll get you home, get you all warm and snuggly, and wrap you up like a little holy sausage. What's that? Uh, that's the baby Jesus from the church. He's supposed to be sleeping in his crib. <gasps> Jesus, they don't understand. I'm not stealing you. I just want to get you warm. Because that is what families do. They shelter each other from the storm. They bring joy where there is sadness. Warmth where there is none. In that movie, my brother Frank tells the story about uh, my mother, the young Angela, how she stole the baby Jesus figurine out of the local church, St. Joseph's. It's a lovely and indeed a great story, and one we heard often, especially at Christmas time. Now, storytelling is essential at Christmas, and it's great at Christmas. And this is when the world slows down and people take time to listen to each other. Now, every culture has its own stories and most share as a means of uh, entertaining, uh, having a laugh, educating, uh, passing along information, passing down traditions, or just uh, giving in a, a, some good common sense to each other. And this year will be no different, even though the world has been on pause since uh, March. Slow for everyone, except for the heroic workers in the front lines of hospitals taking care of people. These are the people we need to remember this Christmas, along with scores of men and women who are out of work. People, they can't be sure their jobs are gonna be there when they return, if they do return. Think of all those who once worked where people gather in the theaters, restaurants, and bars. Restaurants, bars, theaters, yes, indeed. The places we usually meet to hear and tell our stories. And few workers have stood directly in the path of the pandemic than the roughly 10 million people employed by restaurants at the start of the year. This industry shaped close to half of those jobs earlier this year, and they're still down one and a half million. And the next few months will likely bring another round of pain, especially in cold weather states like New York. We may not be able to gather for a few months more, but at least we'll still be able to connect on Zoom, on the phone, or by mail. 
we will be able to tell our stories. And this Christmas will inspire new stories that will be told for years to come. And that's what the Irish do best, tell stories. Our Shanaki, a storyteller, is our national hero. May the stories you tell and hear this Christmas sustain you and keep you through the winter months. And may we meet again refreshed on St. Patrick's Day in March, when the Irish come out of hibernation and tell the world we are back. And if you are far from home, be comforted by the fact that all things, all days change, and we are going to have changes for the better and be comforted by the fact that you will meet, see, and embrace your loved ones, your family, not so far in the future. So, Nolig Shona Dut, a happy Christmas to you and all those you love. Hi, my name is Sarah Binchy, and I'm going to read something for you today. Um, and it's by Maeve Binchy, who was my aunt. And Maeve was a teacher first, and then she became a journalist, and then she became a novelist. And her first novel was Light of Any Candle. It was published in 1982. It was an instant hit. It was a bestseller around the world. And after that, she wrote more than 20 books. And all of them were bestsellers. Uh, I think she sold about 40 million books um, in all. And her books are all still in print. Um, lots of novels and short stories too. And I know she has a lot of fans in the United States and in particular New York, which was a place she loved to visit. So um, here's a little thing that Maeve wrote uh, for you this Christmas. Um, she wrote it back in the 1970s. It was published in her first uh, book of journalism, which is this book here, my first book. Uh, this is long out of print, but the same story, you can find it in a collection of her journalism from the Irish Times. Um, it's called Maeve's Times, and it was edited by Roisin Ingle, and it's still very much in print if you're interested. So the story is a Christmas story. It's by Maeve Benchy. I'll read it for you now. When I was young and spoiled and indulged, instead of being old and spoiled and indulged, I decided late one Christmas Eve that I was going to cancel all previous letters to Santa Claus and ask him for a doll's house. Laboriously and apologetically, I wrote all this to himself and put it up the chimney and retired happily, leaving confusion and sadness amongst those who knew that Santa Claus was bringing me a lovely blackboard and 50 pieces of chalk. A child's Christmas couldn't be ruined, they told each other, but on the other hand, all the shops were closed, doll's houses were out, and Santa Claus was on his way, they knew, with that blackboard. So they tried to make one. For hours and hours, I believe, they laboured on a big box and painted it white and drew windows on it and stuck on chimneys that kept falling off. One of the few rows of their married life developed over the inability to construct a simple thing like a doll's house. Boys should have learned carpentry at school, said my mother in despair as the front of the house caved in yet again. Women should know more about toys, countered my father as he got out the glue pot once more. Then they thought about straw and making a doll's house, Hawaiian style, but this might not be a good idea in case I hadn't heard of Polynesian houses. With all the money we pay at that expensive school, they should have taught her that, said my father but the straw was damp anyway, so that was abandoned. <clears throat> a doll's igloo with cotton wool as snow was considered and also abandoned. A doll's teepee seemed a good idea, but it required bark and skins or canvas, so they had to give that up too, since they'd been thinking of making it with a sheet. 
They ruminated wistfully about my younger sister, then and now easier to please in life, who would be delighted with a rattle or a teddy bear or even nothing at all. To be fair, said my father, she is only two, maybe six. I wonder is it normal for a six-year-old to want a doll's house anyway, said my mother. So they had another hour looking up normal six-year-olds in Dr. Spock or its equivalent, decided it was boringly normal and inconvenient and went back to work. They got bricks and stones in from the garden. They looked up a book called 1000 Things a Boy Can Do, but none of them included making a doll's house. My father became interested in one of the things a boy could do, which was digging a tunnel in the garden to irrigate the flower beds. That's all we need on Christmas Day, said my mother wearily, for the neighbours to see you irrigating the flower beds with tunnels. It was nearly dawn. The fat cherub was asleep with no idea of anything being amiss. They came into my room, set up the blackboard and wrote a note on it with one of the pieces of chalk. Dear Maeve, your chimney is too narrow and I can't get the doll's house down it. Please do not be upset. It will arrive as an extra gift sometime in January. You have been a good girl. All the reindeer are asking for you. Love from Santa Claus. It was morning and with shiny eyes, I was beating on them, begging them to wake up. After only two hours sleep, this wasn't easy for them to do. They showed great alarm. Was I going to threaten to leave home? Were there tears and tantrums which would spoil the day for everyone? Not at all. You'll never believe it, I said. Santa Claus wrote me a note in his own writing. It's on an old blackboard or something, but it's obviously very valuable. Nobody has ever seen Santa Claus writing before. We'll have to show it to everyone. We might lend it to a museum. It was a good Christmas, like all our Christmases were together. The only thing that makes me sad at this time of year is that I may have forgotten to tell them that, but perhaps they knew. Happy Christmas. James Joyce was born on February 2nd, 1882. He was an Irish novelist, short story writer, poet, teacher, and literary critic. He is regarded as one of the most influential and important writers of the 20th century. Joyce is best known for Ulysses, written in 1922, a landmark work in which the episodes reflect those of Homer's Odyssey. His short story masterpiece, The Dead, is one of Ireland's favorite Christmas narratives. In Dublin and around the world, many enthusiasts get together and read that story to highlight the magic of this time of year. It paints a picture of a social event hosted by three aging ladies and the conversations and conventions that we observe at such events. In the story of Gabriel and his wife Greta, we learn about their relationship and are forced to ask ourselves, are they as happy as they seem to be? It forces us to ask, are we as happy in our relationships as we believe? None of us will know for sure. Love and death are two themes that James Joyce explores skillfully. You are unlikely to forget your first love, especially if that person died of a broken heart for you. The memory of Greta's first love, Michael Fury, comes back with a vengeance. He seems to come to life to wedge himself between husband and wife. Here is Gabriel in the final scene of The Dead by James Joyce. She was fast asleep. Perhaps she had not told him the entire story. His eyes moved to the chair over which she had thrown some of her clothes. A petticoat string dangled to the floor. One boot stood upright, its limp upper fallen down. The fellow of it lay upon its side. He wondered at his riot of emotions of an hour before. From what had it proceeded? From his aunt's supper? From his own foolish speech? From the wine and dancing? The merrymaking when saying good night in the hall? The pleasure of the walk along the river in the snow? The air of the room chilled his shoulders. He stretched himself cautiously along under the sheets and lay down beside his wife. He thought of how she who lay beside him had locked in her heart for so many years that image of her lover's eyes, 
when he had told her that he did not wish to live. Generous tears filled Gabriel's eyes. He had never felt like that himself towards any woman, but he knew that such a feeling must be love. The tears gathered more thickly in his eyes, and in the partial darkness, he imagined he saw the form of a young man standing under a dripping tree. Other forms were near. His soul had approached that region where dwell the vast hosts of the dead. He was conscious of, but could not apprehend their wayward and flickering existence. His own identity was fading out into a gray, impalpable world. The solid world itself, which these dead had one time reared and lived in, was dissolving and dwindling. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end, upon all the living and the dead. What's going to happen is the footage that uh, we get tonight is going to also be aired in New York City uh, for their Christmas special. Uh, that's right. We made it, boys, to the big time. So uh, I'm going to call her up on stage right now. Y'all please make welcome Kathy McGuire. We have a show. I'm actually from Ireland, as you can hear from the accent. Um, I was in New York for 10 years, and then I recently moved back to Nashville. Um, to uh, uh, pursue music again for the 75th time. <laughs> Who's all done that before? Um, anyways, the New York Irish Centre in, uh, in New York is airing a show tomorrow or, or on Christmas Eve and they wanted us to close it out. And um, given the ties between the, the Irish music and country western music, it's actually a really good fit. Um, so we'll be, I guess, closing the show out from here. In New York, the likes of Judy Collins, Steve Earle, all those people are on the show up there, and we're the ones that are um, representing Nashville tonight. So, uh, yeah. And they just play it. I'll have a blue Christmas without you.
Thank you so much, Johnny, for that version of Hard Times Come Again No More. We love that song yeah. in Ireland, and we hope that that is uh, a mantra for 2021, that we will see better times ahead. Absolutely. Kathy, thank you for being a part of uh, the show here at the Station Inn, but thank you to everyone who's uh, been a part um, of this broadcast across the globe. Yes, and on behalf of the director of the New York Irish Center, George Heslin, I would like to thank all of the staff in the New York Irish Center, uh, including Turlick McConnell, Ryan McNally, Stephen Long, and all the guys who work really hard there. Um, we're coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. We hope this show made you feel a little bit closer to Ireland. So from Nashville and from New York, respectively, have a very, very happy Christmas until we can see you in person again. Lots and lots of love, and God bless you. Stay safe. Happy New Year. <laughs>